today on Forever Young. What is the AARP's real agenda? With Dale Van Atta, nationally known columnist and author. Stick around, we'll be right back. Forever Young would like to acknowledge the support of these sponsors. The Fun and Fitness Travel Club, which began at a neighborhood pool in Fairfax County, has become a nationwide travel club for active adults. Led by certified fitness instructors Jim Seeley and Cynthia New, this dues-free organization travels worldwide on cruises and land tours, offering members free daily exercise classes in water aerobics, tai chi, yoga, deck walking, ballroom dancing, and sing-alongs. The website is fun-fitness.com and the phone number is 703 8270414 You make me feel so young You make me feel like spring sprung Every time I see you grip I'm such a happy an individual the moment that you speak I want to run play hide and seek I want to go and bounce the moon just like a big balloon Hello and welcome to Forever Young. Today's guest is Dale Van Atten. He's written extensively about the AARP since the 1990s. He's the author of Trust Betrayed, Inside the AARP, and also the co-author of Storm and Norman, An American Hero. He's written extensively for Reader's Digest and has appeared on national television. Welcome, Mr. Dale Van Atta. Thanks for being with us. It's good to be here, Jim. What is the ARP exactly? Is it a service organization or is it something a little more underhanded, just a front for peddling products and services that seniors may or may not need? Well, you just jump, jump right into it, don't you? <laughs> Why waste time? We're a very short show. Uh, we're only half hour. We can't, uh, can't mess around here. It's primarily a business. But on the side, it does some lobbying that I think is very dangerous for some of its members. Um, it is a service organization as well, but most of that service is done by the unpaid volunteers that are talked into it across the country. And uh, tremendous people doing great work, but uh, still being controlled by the AARP staff. What are these uh, lobbying positions that the AARP takes? Well, let me explain a little background first. This is an mm -hmm. organization that was started in 1958 by a retired teacher who found out that they didn't have enough group health insurance. So it was primarily started as the Retired Teachers Association to get teachers group health insurance. So they started group health insurance. And so from the beginning, it was tied to this businessman named Leonard Davis. A lot of scandals over the years because they made tons of money from that. Then they kind of developed into this national organization, 38 million members now, which they claim they're supporting on Capitol Hill. Now, I think it's an insult to senior citizens, to, to, to older Americans, that, that they think that they represent them because these are people from all different sides of the spectrum. They're Republican, Democrat, in between, uh, anarchists, all kinds of things. I've always said it's just interesting you pay a $12.50 fee a year and they'll speak for you no matter what you are. Or and who they you really are. don't poll their members, do they? They don't say, let's poll the members find out what they think on the issue, and then go to Congress and lobby that. They just go right into the lobbying because they've already made up their minds, at least the leadership has. They, they? Uh, pretty much. They do do some polls, but they're carefully written. It's, it's always interesting Leading to questions. me. Yes, it's always <laughs> interesting to me how they uh, manage to get what they want uh, from these various polls. But the polls that were always the most interesting to me was the polls, why did you join AARP? Representation was almost never there. If you look on the website, you'll, you won't even see, we speak for you in Washington. Because I think anyone with half a brain, and most of our older Americans haven't, maybe some of the younger ones don't, um, will, will say, uh, how do they speak for me? They don't even know what I want to, what I want to do. So, yes, they, they presume that they speak for you. Now, the way ARP has gotten some negative publicity as recently as 2003 and then also in the, in the 90s is when they took a position that was in favor of the proposed Medicare, which featured this Medigap insurance, yes. which coincidentally, quink, wink, wink, the uh, ARP had a contract with a company that sold the Medigap insurance, and then you had uh, news reports of people burning their AARP cards. Give us a little bit of background about these incidents. Okay. Um, yes, we all knew, those of us that followed AARP closely, and I reported on it at the time, they were going to make tons of money from this. 
Uh, it is the primary source of revenue for them. It's like the $12.50 that you spend a year for the membership is kind of a bait and switch. That wouldn't even pay for Modern Maturity, for the magazine, for the pages that are in Modern Maturity. What they really want to do is get you in the door to sell you all these things and then use your name for this lobbying. So uh, what happens is, since people don't really want to be lobbied for it, most of the older Americans, if they're not asked about it, they'd rather participate themselves like the volunteers they have. They just take these various positions, and normally it's below the radar. They do whatever they want. They talk to Senator X or Congressman X, and they say to him, we represent 38 million people. We're the 800-pound gorilla, always listed every year as the, the most powerful lobby in Washington. But they really aren't and shouldn't be, and their members should be tearing up their cards if they are speaking for them. So every time they pop up, it's kind of like one of those carnival games, uh, whack-a-gopher. Yeah, the whack-a-mole. <laughs> Every time <laughs> it, they really become public with a position that, that's controversial, they lose members. Oh, yes. Because the members say, I never told them to, to do that for me. And they've done it three major times. Started in 1987 with catastrophic health care. And after that position that they took, they were going to have this wonderful benefit for everybody. It was going to cost tens of billions of dollars over the years. And... But the seniors were the ones who ended up revolting. They ended up repealing it within a year. It created three or four other older American organizations as a result of that. They came back. They thought, all right, we've learned their lesson. I talked to John Rother at one point about that. And he ended up with Ten Commandments. I found a sheet of his that he didn't realize I could get. I'm an investigative reporter and just said, I understand you have this in your desk and you always refer to it after that great failure. He said, yes, I do. I said, it's interesting to me that the, I think the first point on it was, listen to the members' opinions. <laughs> like, maybe that's a good thing if you're going to lobby for them. 1994, they popped up again with uh, Hillary Clinton's uh, health care bill. And at the last minute, it was really a foolish time to do it. They suddenly sided with her, and they lost, you know, a million-plus members as a result of that. Now scroll forward to 2003. Ironically, I think a lot of the members they lost this time around were Democrat because in the end, they want to be perceived as a powerful lobbying organization. It's almost like, uh, I, I mean, he was always liberal before, but he realized once the Republicans were in power, he'd have to, to cozy up to Newt Gingrich and the others and President Bush, that they would really have to get on board if there was going to be any legislation. It was going to be Republican. So they tried to push for as much as they could get, and they benefited financially as, as a nice well, little result. Well, I read that uh, this Medigap insurance that they sell, or at least they don't sell it directly, but they have a contract with another company that sells it, represents 25% of their uh, income. So, and, it, and this uh, plan that they supported, which went through in 2003, created the need, this donut, this donut hole that we've mm -hmm. heard about, mm -hmm. and that, that actually uh, facilitates the need or ne necessitates this uh, Medigap insurance. So talk a little bit about this conflict of interest that just keeps coming up uh, time and time again. They have, yes, they have tremendous conflict in my mind with all the different services. It's not just the health care, it's auto insurance. It's everything an older American might want. So whatever they're lobbying on, they're going to benefit financially from. It is a serious conflict, and more should be said about it. What they, tr what they did, there was a big uh, imbroglio some years ago uh, where the IRS basically said, um, you can't be doing this. You cannot be selling all these things and then lobbying, doing these other things on the side. You are a lobbying organization. So they separated it, but it's just with an accounting thing, AERP Services it's called, and that's the organization that has the contract with all these different uh, health care providers. Well, and so plus on. aren't they supposed to be a non-profit organization, yes. AARP? Yes, and that's, and that's why the IRS said no. It was the, when, they, when the IRS came out at them, it was the biggest settlement in IRS history. They got off cheap. They waited until Clinton was in power, a friend of theirs, and they got off cheap only a hundred and thirty five million dollars but they probably should have paid about five hundred million i mean this is a half billion dollar a year organization plus uh, and most of it comes from this revenue not from membership fees and i think it's quite alarming because it is a very nominal fee so you would think that uh, most people that are over fifty uh, are uh, going to be a member just because it would theoretically pay for, the, for itself in hotel savings and things like that. 
But I, um, uh, you were just saying that there are only 38 members. There really should be over 100 million members because of that's how many people in this country are over 50. Yes. So it, it, it is just this huge red flag that a relatively small percentage, I mean, you can sign up, uh, you did mention it's 1250 uh, a year, but you could sign up for five years and it works out to only be about $5 a year. Yeah. So it's this unbelievably nominal fee. Uh, so, it, it, I guess that is a huge red flag, isn't it? That it so it is a red flag. One of the things I had the most fun about uh, investigating this over the years was what is their true membership? I mean, quite a bit of that, uh, I can't tell you the percentage of that 38 million are dead. I mean, they'll send you notices for years. Uh, one of my favorite things is they solicited Mark Twain. Uh, they found the Samuel Clemens Museum up in Hartford. That was many of the solicitations. They decided that Samuel Clemens was over 50. So they sent him an offer in the mail. Well, he was born in the 1800s, yeah, wasn't he? And, and, <laughs> and so the museum people there thought, well, let's have some fun. So they filled out an application for him. And they also put in there, also known as Mark Twain. They also put when he was born, like whatever it was, early 1800s. He got a membership as a result. So, I mean, these are the 38 million, that's really padded figures. Another thing about the 38 million, they assume they have a spouse, even if your spouse is not alive. So if you pay for the member, the actual members are probably less than 20 million. They assume a certain percentage. And, and one year, this tells you the, the shell game that they play all the time. One year they decided they didn't want to show that their membership went down. So they kind of are regulated by the advertising industry in terms of their magazine. They can't lie about the paid memberships because that's the subscription rate and that's how you sell ads. So they saw that it looked like they were going down, but they wanted to publicly say they weren't. So they jimmied the number. The advertisers basically said, you can, instead of saying 1.5, you have one member, yeah, half of those members that you have that have paid for it uh, have a spouse that's probably alive. But they said they could use the number 1.7. So one year they changed it from 1.5 to 1.6, and they added 3 million members overnight <laughs> just with that. So they're always and, and then they can like take that. they can take this <coughs> artificially inflated number, go as the lobbyist organizations say we now represent all these other yes. people, and then they can go to these uh, providers where they have this conflict of interest arrangement and say we now have more potential people for you. But it is extremely alarming that their membership has been declining because by all rights it should be, should be much higher. Much higher because we keep reading about this huge bubble of baby boomers yes. and uh, you know uh, another baby boomer turns 50, is it every eight minutes, every eight something seconds like or something that. like that in America. And so theoretically their membership roles should be swelling to overcapacity and actually they've been declining. No, they've definitely been declining as a percentage of the population and they knew it was coming too. There was no way they could get around it. Baby boomers don't like to join organizations and baby boomers also generally seem to know their lobbying group as well so they think about it twice. Well plus you mentioned in your book that people are just overwhelmed. Their mailboxes are just oh. full of all these solicitations. Well yeah, once you sign on then you've got these ten different products from ten different companies, these very large companies, fire insurance, all these different things, and they're going to solicit you. And, and they, they may paid not for the right to solicit. Right, you. and they may not be the best deal out there. They, they're, for, you, for, for you, the consumer, they're definitely the best deal out there for the ARP, but not necessarily for the consumer. Yes, they aren't. And an example would be, I mean, in this case, they're trying to be egalitarian, is their life insurance program. Uh, if you are female, you can get a much better deal anywhere else. Anywhere else. That's um, very significant because ARP would say, no, we have they negotiated this, yes. the best possible deal for you. Yes, it's because longevity, they, because they don't want to discriminate, it doesn't matter whether you're male or female, whereas if you're outside the organization, so, so the males pay higher rates. I'm sorry, it's males. If you're male, you're going to pay a higher rate. We die sooner generally. So outside, males pay a lower rate, but because they, they don't discriminate between men and women in this particular program, they're going to pay a higher rate to equalize the cost of that life insurance to pay for the women who live longer. <laughs> this is a uh, very uh, interesting topic because the ARP has a multi, tens of millions of dollars machine uh, to really put out a public um, 
message of that it is a service organization and there are very few people such as yourself that are saying, wait a minute, there are some things that we should really look at. Um, for example, now there have been a very few people throughout the years that have actually tried to, including some within the organization that have tried to do the whistleblowing thing, and in your book you write how they were uh, silenced through intimidation, through money. Uh, can you tell us a couple instances of that happening? There was an executive director who was fired, and she was fired uh, some years ago. She was fired because she went up against their insurance interests. Uh, she went up against one of the the co-founder, Leonard Davis, and didn't like the way she was supposed to be lobbying and running the organization. Executive directors are supposed to be at the beck and call of the board of directors, uh, which is a volunteer board, but these are people that have already been called and they're part of the organization by the time they get there. I mean, they, they view the volunteers, frankly, when we talk about service organizations, as a group to be managed. One of the things I came across that I did not realize was there is they, they spend a lot of money doing a board game called volunteer management. How do you motivate the volunteers? How do you get them essentially selling for AARP? And they do a very good job. Free tickets, nice buses, some food, some really nice coffee at the various places. These things work. And for the board of directors, a lot of whom haven't been in business or anything, you know, they're flown all over the country and they speak. So they kind of stay in line with what the executive director and, the law and John Rother want. So, uh, yeah, it's kind of bogus that way. They make sure people toe the line. Any other instances of people who have somehow been kind of hushed up when they were trying to uh, do the whistleblowing thing on the AARP? Well, I should say that for writing this book, two of the best sources I had uh, were both fired when it was discovered they were speaking mm. with me. So th there was, th they really don't like people to criticize them, especially from within the organization. And they pay their staff so well, most of whom are young and wouldn't qualify to be AARP members. I mean, they're in this building that they pay, what, $30 million a year rent on, that I called it the Taj Mahal, because, and everything in the building is anti-senior. Marble floors that the Canes, you know, will go out on. They, they were not thinking of their membership when they built the building. Very low lights. Uh, if a member, for instance, has, a, has a, a difficulty and needs to get to the bathroom quickly, you have to have a key to go into the bathroom. So, I mean, there's just so many kind of humiliating things for uh, older people who go there. Um, it's just, it, it, it's, it's a show game. Now, some people might be watching this program and they might think, well, overall, the AARP uh, does do more good than it does uh, you know, and they've got to make a living and they've got to pay their bills. Do you feel that overall the ARP is, is a positive force for good or do you think there's just so much uh, negative uh, things going on with conflict of interest and, and shady lobbying and other shady deals that it really is, is, is should, should even be disbanded perhaps one day? I do not feel it's a positive force for good. I believe, I mean, I have maintained for years now they should just be a business. They should not do any lobbying because they just, it just outrages me that they lobby on behalf of members who don't know about it. I did a figure once to try to figure out, okay, out of all the surveys they took, how many joined for representation? When you got down to the number, it was definitely less than, for instance, the National Rifle Association. So to me, there are groups that are lobbying that should be more powerful than the AARP because people actually join those organizations to be lobbied for on specific positions they know. Okay, what about these celebrity endorsements? It always seems like uh, the ARP is kind of, uh, has some celebrity that's uh, promoting uh, one of their products or services or even on the covers of their magazines and different things. Yes, they, they, uh, they pay a lot of money. <laughs> And, and one of the best gigs celebrities knows besides the endorsements, which is a really good point. I mean, I mean, of course, it also means it buys them um, influence with these people, and they'll speak well of them. Um, I remember uh, several years ago, uh, Lynn Cheney, the wife of the vice president, called me up and said, you know, I've been invited to speak uh, at the AARP biennial convention, which could be like ten dollars or $20,000 very big in the speaking world. Should I go? I said, yes, but you ought to say what you want to say. It's a, it's a good audience. These are good people that come to it. 
uh, and I don't want to dismiss them that come to the convention, but there's a natural tendency, she told me after she had been, to want to help them. And this is before she was the vice president's wife. So, and a Republican, which at the time, they were definitely Democrat. They've skewed a little Republican in their lobbying during the Bush years, but now they're scrambling. They're trying to persuade the Democrats, we're coming back to our core. Now that you're in power, now that you are running uh, the Congress, uh, we want to come back into your fold again. And they're naturally a little leery. I mean, and, and it's outrageous to me that they switch back and forth without regard to what the members think. That's my bottom line. Well, in a moment, we're going to talk about some of the other projects you've been working on. Mm -hmm. Any final thoughts, though, about the uh, AARP? They're going to continue to exist because of the discounts. I'm just going to keep plugging away and appreciate uh, having the time to talk about them here, making the members aware. When they are aware, they do rise up in droves and, and often leave, realizing the discounts are wor aren't worth it. It's not worth selling their vote, in effect, if the lobby is truly affecting congressmen and senators on the Hill, which it does. So, yes, if you do not feel you should be lobbied for, then you should drop out of the organization. Okay, that's very good to know. Now, you've also uh, participated in the writing of other books, including being the co-author of the, autobi of the uh, biography mm -hmm. rather, of uh, General Schwarzkopf. Uh, what was that like for you to uh, interview this man and, and put together his story? That was actually a great experience. This was the first Gulf War, and uh, at the time I was writing a column with a man named Jack Anderson. We were in a thousand newspapers across the country, and we're also writing for Parade Magazine. And I called him up like in January of that year, uh, as soon as the first bomb dropped, and I said, I'm aware of who this man is, General Schwarzkopf. The public is not. He's going to be a great hero because he's a great man. He's a muddy boot soldier. He came up from the ranks, you know, and he won't get our soldiers killed unnecessarily. I think we ought to do a profile. And they said, okay, they spent all this money to send me over there to, to talk with him. When I came back, they told me, nobody is interested in him. So we, you know, they were a little concerned and just said, I think we're going to drop the piece. Three days later, the press we got called by a national publisher saying, oh. this guy is going to be huge. This is mm. before he did the press briefing. Oh, it was before the press briefing. Yes, okay. was, so the, he wasn't really well known in the public. And it, it was a wonderful experience. It must have been wonderful. Now, what about your uh, articles that you've written for Reader's Digest magazine? Yeah, I write several articles for them every year. I, for instance, I do a yearly one on America's worst judges, and that's always fun. For some reason, we get dozens and hundreds of candidates from the readers all across the country. <laughs> this judge is terrible, so it's a hard thing picking out which one. The one I'm currently working on uh, is um, world's most dangerous leaders in terms of America's interest, the ones we're most concerned about. So we kind of look at all the people in the world and say who's, and some of the usual suspects, Iran and so on. And you're also now starting to work with people doing their own personal biographies. Tell us about that. Yeah, I have a great belief that people should be writing their own life history. And many people who've had some interesting lives, and more interesting than they think usually, uh, never get around to it. They will spend a lifetime building up wealth and so on to leave to their kids. But to me, the legacy, the best legacy to leave is the stories of their life, how they reached the, how they came by the principles and the various things that really should be passed on. So I've been talking with people who are in the business, in their mind, want to leave a legacy for great-great-grandchildren, a nice book. It doesn't have to be published, but it can be. You know, I was fortunate enough to um, lead a group, of, a charter group of seniors to the uh, newly opened World War II Memorial on its oh, opening wow. weekend. And I'll tell you that I'm so glad I went. People said, oh, no, wait till after it's died down and the crowds have gone away. But that opening weekend, there were so many of these stories that you talked about. There were letters. There were photographs. And each one, I would have been willing to buy a book about any one of these yes. stories. And um, unfortunately, the, I guess the Park Service clears away this mem mem memorabilia after, at the end of each day. I hope they're saving it somewhere and maybe going to do something with it at some point. Yeah. Um, I agree with you on that. In fact, that's one of the things when Tom Brokaw was doing his first book and the one since, Greatest Generation. Right. And as, as Senator Dole and uh, Tom Hanks and others were doing this World War II thing and were getting these letters, some of the grandkids of those wonderful men and women were starting to realize, boy, they never talked about this. I'd really like to know about this. Because a lot of grandparents don't think their kids are interested in it. But there will be a point at which they will be. So you want to have those stories. 
That's true. A lot of their, um, they're called the greatest generation for a reason because they're very humble. They don't want to sing their own praises, but they're all heroes. So thank you very much uh, you, for joining Jim. us, and uh, it's wonderful to have you with us. For more information about Dale Van Atta's books and articles and other projects, please visit our website, foreveryoungtv.org. That's www.foreveryoungtv.org. Look forward to seeing you on a future episode. Thanks for joining us today. Production facilities provided by Fairfax Public Access, Fairfax, Virginia.